20 years for presidential elections. I see another young man in the name of Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. And I ask why not? And the name Uhuru Kenyatta has featured prominently. That's what happened to Uhuru in 2008. People recognized him as now, not so much the son of Jomo, but is Uhuru the man. Participated in three years. I hereby declare Mr. Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta. One, two. Oh, Lost one. In fact, people are happy for Kibaki to win and then uh, Nacha Uhuru for the future. Karibu. Karibu and skipped one. He made a very bold decision. And it was the right decision. Also shows you he has been very consistent in leading his people and also appreciating the interest of his people. Our nation has now successfully navigated the most complex general election in our history. Tonight on The Kenyan Historian, Prince to King. I, Uhuru Kenyatta, I assume as President of the Republic of Kenya, in full realization of the high calling, I assume as President of the Republic of Kenya, In 2016, while covering President Kenyatta's visit of the Kingdom of Belgium, <laughs> journalists were asking about a variety of questions. <laughs> but I was more interested in his past, <laughs> especially his relationship with Kenya's second president, Daniel Arap Moy. President Moy is retiring. Yes. And then he says he's going for a young tank yes. to lead the country. Yes. Did you have any imagination that you are the person the president was looking at? I'll tell that story once, but I won't tell it today. I, I, but I will tell that story at the appropriate time. All the best to you. And so seven years after he promised to tell the story, I tracked down a man who knew him before his political stardom. Former Gatanga MP, David Murade. We started in high school. He was in St. Mary's and I was in Nairobi school. And we would engage in terms of uh, sports. We'd love to defeat them in rugby. It was always very vicious. And then we left school. I went to the University of Nairobi. He went to Amherst. He tells me about Uhuru's love for rugby. He was both. He was a player and then the teams, whenever they, we played them in their place, we would all go to cheer our side. Whenever they were playing, remember they were just across the street. St. Mary's is on St. Austin's. We are on Wayakiwe in uh, Nairobi school. And in between, Loreto Convent, Musongari, the girls. And we were fighting over the girls. But Uhuru Kenyatta was no ordinary student or rugby player and supporter. He was the son of Kenya's first president. Born in 1961, shortly after his father, Jomo Kenyatta was released from nearly a decade in British jails from Prince Philip on behalf of the Queen of England. And before becoming Kenya's first president in 1964, an elated Muse Jomo Kenyatta named him Uhuru. The Swahili equivalent for freedom. His mother was Ngina, famously called Mamangina. 
an African prince, he was born. His father was, after all, the leader of African nationalism in Kenya. Some of them have misunderstood us. And the post independence presidency was his to throw away. It is not my wish that I should be speaking to you in a foreign and for that matter in col colonialistic language. The other children you are talking about were kind of old. Uh, the first one who had been born in the 1920s uh, and uh, had gone through some times. So had his sister. So the released Kenyatta, the one who came from jail, vigorous and so forth, so a lot of attention were paid to his children, the new children, not the old ones, the new children. And of the new children, Uhuru was the first. At this time, Kenya's independence was not a matter of if, but when. But here I am, ladies and gentlemen. I am just a human being like yourself. Uhuru became Mzee's darling. He was raised and treated as a prince ordained for the throne. And when Kenya became a republic and at a young age, he accompanied his father to state functions and cabinet meetings. The elders had extra respect, uh, attention to him because of his father. And uh, maybe some of the problems he had was trying to fit in, to separate himself from the father and be a, a young man, be a boy. And then other people trying to figure out how to deal with him so as not to annoy the father. One thing always was, was a pillar of strength. He always felt that so long as he was there, nothing could ever go wrong, right? There was always somebody, or there was always a shoulder to lean on. It took time for us to actually realize that he wasn't there anymore. <laughs> His parents ensured he mastered his native Kikuyu language. And the Swahili language that was spoken widely in Kenya. He was raised for operatable purposes in Gatondo. Eh? And in Gatondo, what, what do you have there? The neighborhood, who are these people? See, they speak Kikuyu. They speak Kikuyu. Now, the area of privilege that one might think about is when he went to the schools. Eh? Because the schools he attended were not regular schools, we say that. They were the, the elite schools eh? for the elite children. And so he associated with other elite children and some of them became his long-life friends. Eh? But it was his closeness with Daniel Arap Moy, Kenya's vice president from 1967, and his father's principal assistant that would shape his political future decades later. You see, Moy was like a father figure to Uhuru. Remember, Kenyatta died in 1978, when Uhuru was barely 16. Remember, Uhuru was born in 1961. So, the person under whose patronage Uhuru grew up was Nyayo. 
when Jomo Kenyatta was very busy with the matters of state, Moi would actually go on behalf of Kenyatta like the parents' days. <laughs> or school prize giving days, he would go when uh, handling his own children, Gideon, Philip. He would also stand in for Jomo Kenyatta. There's a story where that uh, when the real uh, traditional power, kitchen cabinet of Jomo, were meeting. Nugeshuru, Bioko Inange, Joroge Mungai, that group. You know in Kikuyu they say the Ngato Arie. And Nyayo would be playing drafts with the little boys, Kina Uhuru, when those guys are doing their thing. So there was that connection between Uhuru and Nyayo. As the son of Kenya's founding father, Uhuru Kenyatta always had the name, the wealth, and the burden that comes with his heritage. Uru was your normal guy on the street. You'd go partying, you'd go to the nightclubs, you'd go, you know, on uh, picnics, trips, nyamachoma. He was not like the son of a president. He was your ordinary guy in the street. Very, very down to earth. Nobody ever thought he had uh, or he harbored any political ambition. The young Kenyatta always shied away from politics, wanting to be seen as an ordinary person at ease with ordinary Kenyans. In 1989, we all started getting married. He was among the people who were part of my uh, wedding. In fact, my, his car is the one that went for my wife in their village to bring her to Safari Park for us to go to the church. And then in 1990, he also got married. And we also participated in his marriage. It was during this period that the fight for multi-party democracy was at its peak. Kenya was a one-party state. Political intolerance had defined Daniel Moy's rule. It was a very difficult time, of course there were those arrests. Uh, if I give my personal uh, experience, I was arrested so many times, had so many cases. I don't know which part of the country Oh, I had not been taken to court or taken into a prison or a police station, uh, so it was constant. Dissent was met with a heavy hand of the Kanu regime. Detention without trial was business as usual. not remember this, but him and uh, Mboya and uh, Agwins, uh, Caesar, Kothek, people like Alfred Gitonga, the way they issued a statement, remember that uh, Saitoti committee that went around and uh, generated a report that said Kenyans don't want multi-party. When people like Uhuru, the sons of the rich, the sons of the powerful, who were supposed to be establishment, when they came out and uh, said, yes, the country needs multipartyism, that I think jolted uh, Nyayo. Before 1997, Uhuru Kenyatta was only known in the business world. A lot of people don't understand something. Uhuru is actually not the politician. His brother Mohoho Kenyatta is the politician. But people think Mohoho is a businessman and that Uhuru is the politician. But any 
business decisions, family and their decisions as a business, who is the chairman? And he's the one who takes uh, those decisions. And the converse is also true. Any political decisions, Moho uh, Kenyatta, the one they call MK, is the chairman. It is rumored that he supported Mwai Kibaki's campaign for the top seat in 1992. The former vice president had resigned from his position as minister for health after the reintroduction of the multi-party politics in Kenya, which he initially opposed. His entrance into opposition politics destabilized the Forum for Restoration of Democracy Food, as CIA Senator James Orengo states. The uh, special branch was now why, uh, well aware of, of the uh, discussions and the divisions that were emerging from Ford. So quite a number of them traveled to, uh, to the United Kingdom and told Matiba that, you know, this is your chance. Uh, and, and, and secondly, you know, they told him that, you know, if he did not take his chance, then, then Mwai Kibaki was going to, to eclipse him. Uh, uh, and uh, Matiba was taken in, uh, but not absolutely, until the day when he came back and was received uh, in a way that I don't think a leader has been received in Kenya until uh, the time when Raila also was received. And then when he came, he had a very good reception at the airport, our president. Now, when he saw that reception, every politician, by the way, is moved by the ground. The one came waving. And then they come waving. They, they were blackguards, yeah. waving him to be the president. The first thing he did when he now landed in Ford was a big quarrel with Jaramogi Odinga. And that trap caused, caused a split in Ford. Daniel Arap Moy will win the race against a divided opposition. But the then self-proclaimed professor of Kenyan politics started looking at the future of Kano 10 years from 1992. You have to vote for me. The repealing of Section 2A of Constitution had also brought in a new phenomena. Presidential term limit. So Moy was legally barred from contesting for the top seat in 2002. <laughs> Lakini niloko pangu ni kwamba tuende mbele na msingi wetu ni Mwenyezi Mungu. And so he started scheming how the leadership of Kanu and Kenya would be like without him at the helm. Even over this thing that Moi would like to cling to power. Nataka kutangazia nini? Kwamba wakati wa kustaafu kwangu and few saw it coming. The son of his predecessor, Uhuru Mwegai Kenyatta, was at the center of his plans. Ahead of the 1997 general election through party elections, he made Uhuru the chairman of Kanu, Gatundu branch, and will ask him to contest for the area parliamentary seat, which was once held by his father. We knew he can't win on a Kanu ticket. I remember we spent an evening in the Aishaweri home. Me a friend of ours called Peter Gomba, son of the former mayor of Nairobi. And he explained to us, because we told him, no matter what you do, and uh, Kanu under the circumstances, you won't get elected. But he explained to us why he cannot go 
against Moy. He will suffer the first setback of his political career. He was outvoted by Moses Muhia. So you could see there was um, a system, a grooming system for Uhuru to become something. And among all the young men of his age, those they had grown together and all those things, I mean, they, they, he kind of stood out because, um, not only because of his father, but also because more he wanted him. In 1997, Moi had insisted that whoever was going to be elected on a canoe ticket from central Kenya would succeed him in 2002 as president. So he was going to name him the vice president. They all ran. They all failed. Uru failed. Kamado. Hidunguri, Kariukiwa, Gata, all, you know, they all failed, including I defeated SK Macharia in 1997. He was running on Kanu. Remember, Moi took 14 months after that election to name a vice president. And uh, when he then gave it to Saitoti back, it was very derogatory. Sawa, nitawapatia nione kama itawaongezea masufuria ya ugali. You remember? Yes. So yes, it's true they tried to get Uhuru. Uhuru refused. Moy won the presidency and it was his final term at State House. And so he put in motion a crash succession program. First of all, he declared his desire to hand over the baton to someone young and energetic. And so young politicians started jostling for his attention. We can only, it can only be fair if the 21st century is given to the dot-com generation. Wananchi wetu wanaendelea kufilisika kwa sababu viongozi wenyewe waendelea kujitafutia yao. Na ikiwa wataendelea, tuasema basi vijana wako tiari kuungana, kufanya kazi pamoja, diyo tuweze kusaidia wananchi wa taifa hii netu la Kenya. Naangalia macho yake vizuri sana, tunataka atumie saini yoyote kuonyesha ni direction gani and will be in full combat together. Elders katika bunge, kila mmoja wao wakiwa mwanasiasa anasema, mimi niko na vijana. They are proud of the youth. Mimi niko na vijana. I think it is time ata sisi kama vijana tuseme, sisi tuko na waze. Because Moi was saying he still wants Uhuru to play an active role in politics, and we were Uhuru. We insisted, yes, uh, show us good faith. And that is when he made him a chair of an interministerial committee. It was a disaster. Then they made him chair of uh, tourism, tourism board. The Kenyan economy was collapsing. <laughs> Middle-class Kenyans were angry. The PC is not elected by anybody. Whatever is here, it's you appointed see, appointed by one person. Whatever you see here is illegal. Yes. It has been declared by the Provincial Security Committee as illegal. And Moi knew his government and Kano needed freshness. I would possibly agree that it, uh, it is not my initiative, because as I've been a team player, and I have always been ready to. Uh, work with anybody who has the interests both of our party and of the country at heart and uh, from that perspective I think I was prepared to play as I've said many many times in the past any role that I would be offered either by my party or by Kenya. He pushes Makto 
to vacate his position as nominated MP. On this particular day in 2001, Raila Odinga and Musalim Davadi welcomes 41-year-old Uhuru Kenyatta into parliament as nominated MP, taking over from Makto. Uhuru, Raila and Musalia, what the common man, the denominator among them? They are all children of the elite. Uh, Musalia, the son of who? Uh, Moses Mudamba, Substone, a uh, powerful minister for local government, and a very close of Daniel Aramoy. Very close friend, because it said that it was Moses Mudavadi who actually promoted Moi to become a member of the Legical, or helped him uh, when he was education minister. You look at uh, Raila, who is he? Son of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, another prominent. So you have the children, the children of prominent personalities, then in parliament receiving the child of another prominent person. He quotes Raila Odinga, who leaves the opposition benches to join government. He makes him minister and gives him the powerful secretary general position of the new Kano. By this time, Moy is still keeping his long-term plans for Kenyatta close to his chest. He's made minister for local government and later, one of the four vice chairmen of Kanu. Slowly but steadily, Moy was pushing aside his long-time loyalists like Professor George Saitoti, creating room for Uhuru Kenyatta to ride to the top of the party hierarchy. There come a time when the nation is more important than an individual. It is because of that consideration and in consultation that I say I shall not offer myself for any, as a guy for any position. A fascinated media industry shadowed moves made by those seen as possible successors to the outgoing president. Professor George Saitoti, Moi's longtime vice president, Raila Odinga, the party's new secretary general, and the man Moi recruited to revamp the independence party. Musaliam Davadi, Katanangala, and Kalonzo Msioka. Fika hapa kutulaki, nitasema mingi, waka baadae baadae kwa angalia mambo mgada. One day, as Moy returned from overseas, he suggested that none of them was close enough. <laughs> then one evening, and during his visit of Mount Elgon region, he declared that Uhuru Kenyatta was indeed the chosen one. The man was very unpopular at the time. By August of 2002, it was clear to many people that the NAK, the alliance between Kibaki, Wamalwa and Gilu, NAP, was winning. They were, they were clearly they were winning. And the question is, the side, the other side, the country side was losing. Well, initially I thought that it is possible for Moi to sell a project. I was quite naive as well. And uh, I thought that if Moi says it, it'll happen. That's what I thought. I must tell you frankly. And you know it was a difficult decision for me. You know I come from Nyeri. And his opponent was Moi Kibaki from my home county. My own brother, the late Derito Kashagwa, the first governor of Nyeri and an MP of Madeira was a candidate under Mwai Kibaki. And we had sort of a family conflict because we are opposing, we are having different sides. But I was so convinced that whatever Moi wanted will happen. And since I wanted to be in government and I had been given a very senior position, I was quite happy. But along the way, 
what I know today, even Uru knows. Never thought there is any combination that can defeat Kanu at that time. You see, Moi was such a colossus. He was. We, we didn't believe Moi can lose uh, an election. His endorsement of Uhuru as his preferred presidential candidate will create a crisis in Kanu. Disagreements. Fallouts. That was the move as it emerged. And then the once indomitable party that ruled Kenya since independence collapsed. And he annoyed a lot of people who thought that they should be the one. Eh? Uh, Raila Odinga, who had uh, merged with Khan in the expectation that he might be the one. Saitoti, who was told that although he's a friend, he's, he's, he doesn't qualify. <laughs> Kalonzo Musioka, who keeps on saying that uh, he should have been the one. You know, uh, Simeon Yachai, who led the rebellion against Kanu on these things. So there are all these people who expected Moi to get out so that they can get in. By the time Raila made a decision to boot out, it was too late. We had gone too far. And uh, even that time, Raila had gone for discussion. And Moi could hear none of it. The fact that, uh, you know, he was asking Moi, why don't you let us go to a delegates conference and come up with a presidential card? Don't force one on us. Because Raida was Secretary General of the party. And uh, Moi said, you know, I've already decided. Just the way who has decided. You know, he was very stubborn. And uh, thought that uh, he held the sway. And whatever he said, Kenyans must do. And he believed this system nonsense about the district commissioners, about the chiefs, about the police. You know, Moi was saying, Tukona policy, Tukona madisi, Tukona kila kitu, Tukona pesa, you know. And we were saying this thing is not working. Time had come for Kanu to relinquish power. Uhuru is fresh. He has a global perspective, which is today's way of doing things. And in fact, we were doing very well until Raila came and said, Kibakitosha. And then we knew our goose was cooked. But up to that build up, Uhuru was doing very, very well as a Kanu candidate for 2002. So, it is uh, something that was thrust uh, upon him by circumstances, but he was up to it, he was up to the task, and he was willing to do it. Continuing where the son of Jomo Kenyatta was literally seen as sustaining the Kano Mafia state, where Moi will still dictate the running of things in the house on the hill. The splinter group led by Raila Odinga, Professor George Saitoti and Kalonzo Msioka walked straight into the waiting arms of opposition leaders Charity Ngilu, Omalwa Kijana and Mwai Kibaki. When I've looked around and talked to people with whom we have finally agreed on how to proceed and with whom we have begun putting together the manifesto we shall present to Kenyans. I am convinced that we have a team which is going to be very, very strong. A juggernaut, the National Rainbow Coalition was formed. Uhuru, Moi's preferred successor, will be overwhelmed. There are some areas that we have definitely not gone the right path or not followed the right path. And I would like to see us be able to say, okay, let's now draw a line. This is where we start from. Let's learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past. And let's use that learning experience to be able to help us and to move us forward into the future. How will he have countered an infectious knock wave that was sweeping the country? And we believed in Kibaki. We believed in the team, we believed in Kijana Omalwa, and, and we saw hope. 
So, and, that, and that's how we came in. For Uhuru at that time, and Ruto, and Msalia. See, we looked at them very differently. We looked at them as these are the young tax of Moi, all the challenges we are facing, the, the, they are part of that problem. They are young, they are supposed to be advising Moi, but they've taken advantage of Moi, and all they want is to see their things move. You know, in fact, let me tell you, people thought Moi had a plan B. You know, we were in the state house when the results were coming through, and some people were asking, is Moi aware of these results? What is he saying? When is he activating plan, plan B? There was no plan B. It's not possible. The presidential election only confirmed what was inevitable. A resounding win from Waikibaki and the NAC coalition. It will be Uhuru's major political defeat to date. Mwai kibaki na hapa kwamba nitatenda kazi zangu za urai wa Jamhuri ya Kenya wa uaminifu December 31st 2002 Mwai kibaki takes the oath of office as Kenya's third president I felt disappointed, as of course anybody would feel, that I had lost. But I also felt it was my responsibility to accept that I had lost, and I did. I think one of the things he built for himself was a value of respect, a value of appreciating I can win, but also it's a, it's a, it's, it's a competition I can lose. And it also gave him another uh, platform to now build himself. For the son of Kenya's first president, it's time to get back on the horse, taking the loss on his stride, and try to learn all he could from the experience. That is what he told me during our interview in 2016. He was ready for the next step. And after that, I went back to regroup to start my life again, because my life does not mean the beginning and the end of Kenya, no. Kenya comes first. Kenya is greater than anybody else. I felt disappointed, as of course anybody would feel, that I had lost. But I also felt it was my responsibility to accept that I had lost, and I did. When he's leaving, you have some moments of anxiety, you know, personal anxiety. Uh, what will it be? Uh, what kind of regime is coming in? Um, is this going to be a situation where there's victimization? Or is this going to be a situation where the rule of law uh, will be followed, that a new government has, 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 uh, uh, is going to come in? He you know, exhibited strong leadership and put the country first by conceding defeat. So whichever way it went, everybody was happy. In fact, people were happy for Kibake to win and then uh, Nacha Uhuru and groom him for the future. I accept the choice of the people and in particular, now concede that Mr. Mwai Kibake will be 
for the third president of the Republic of Kenya. It was some kind of an insurance that even after Kibaki, we would still have a formidable uh, figure who can uh, step into Kibaki's shoes. Coming second in the presidential race and having won the Gatundu parliamentary seat, he became the official leader of the opposition and parliament. Uru is the kind of person who will fall, wake up, dust himself and move on. Remember the first time he ran in 97, he lost. He got up, dusted himself and moved on. In 2002, he challenged Moe Kibaki and lost. Got up, dusted himself and moved on. Cracks in the Mwai Kibaki NAC government would, however, hand him an easy job. It was infighting within government. The opposition of Kanu was not felt because there was opposition within. Now, the mistake we did as politicians and leaders for this country is the politics of deceit. We cheat each other. Backstabbing. These are the things that is haunting the country. And that's why after, after, after Kibaki was sworn in, the gates were closed. And the gates were closed by one person called Matere Kereri, the controller of State House. These are the new operators. This will be, yes, it will be like this. Yes, it will be like this. will be enough. Then came the push for a new constitution that left the NAC government disjointed. 2005, Kenyans are headed for a referendum vote. Mwai Kibaki, with the helping hand of Attorney General Amos Wako, has just altered the bomber's draft of the constitution. Progressive proposals have been expunged and the new Wako draft is stirring controversy and divisions. A disgruntled group of the NAG government has opposed the Wako draft of the constitution, joining Kano and Uhuru Kenyatta to oppose it. It was under immense pressure, immense pressure, I must say, to, to, to go to the yes side. But I think his decision was that um, history will judge us. We were part of that uh, no side. Joe Nyaga, Kamodo, even uh, the late child Jonjo. Myself, J.B. Muturi, we were all part of that no side, including at that time Rigadi, Rigadi Gashagua. And uh, we knew we were with the rest of the country. When he led us into ODM and we followed him into ODM, he went alone with a few of us. The people of the mountain remained behind. And the result was there in the referendum in 205. The people of the Mount Kenya, yeah, yeah voted for the DZ. At the ballot, the orange team carries the day. So the, the image that comes out is that the banana side was really not serious. And uh, because there were maybe some things in that draft constitution that they themselves did not want. And notice that Kibaki was very quick to concede, say, the motion, is, the, 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 the draft is lost. People have rejected it. I remember that time Mia was with Kibaki. We went with the government, with Banana. Why? Because for us women, you see this thing of two-thirds, we would have finished it at that time. Because we had gotten the district seats. And remember, we had so many districts. And so we, we, we were going the Ugandan way, where they've taken districts to be constituencies of women, where women compete for themselves. That issue of two-thirds gender today would be a gold case. Fellow Kenyans, following the results of the referendum, it has become necessary for me, as the President of the Republic, to reorganize my government to make it more cohesive 
and better able to serve the people of Kenya. Accordingly, in accordance with the powers conferred upon me under the Constitution of Kenya, I have directed that the offices of all ministers and all assistant ministers become vacant. Consequently, the occupants of the said offices cease to hold their respective offices with the immediate effect. Ahead of the 2007 general election, the Orange Movement transforms into a political outfit. The Odinga-led movement was mounting a serious challenge against the incumbent, Mwai Kibaki. Uhuru was initially a member of this camp, but opted out. In fact, I had serious discussions with him. He said, we have lost our people. You know, we are not in tandem with the thinking of our people. And I think we need to adjust. His advisors among them, David Murade and Jem Muturi, the current State House Chief of Staff, advised him going against President Mwai Kibaki could hurt him in the future. After very serious consultation and soul searching, he made a very bold decision. And it was the right decision. The, the quest was not for him becoming a leader. For the quest was what can we achieve? What is achievable? In the end, Uhuru will be cautious. Dropped his presidential ambition. Left the Orange Democratic Movement. After the 2005 referendum, these are the people ganged up. You know, Kumbuka, the one who was saying, Wembe ni ule ule. Right? The same way we defeated them in the referendum, the same way we're going to defeat them in the general election. So, to a large extent, uh, Uhuru felt obligated to support uh, Mwai Kibaki. And rallied behind the re-election bid of Mwai Kibaki. And the thinking was, if a new person came in, he would do 10 years. But if you support Mwai Kibaki and he wins, he's going for five. And that informed, look, would you rather wait for 10 or wait for five? Karibu! Karibu life! And then of course the community interests, all right? And that is how now Uhuru emerged as a defender of the community. And Uhuru also emerged out of uh, that decision. He, he, he captured Kibaki's base. Remember in 2002 they had split. All the way from Nairobi to River Chania had gone with Uhuru. From Chania River towards Nyeri, Meru, Embu, they had gone with Kibaki. So that in itself just consolidated. The entire, he inherited the entire Kibaki block and his own uh, block. Ni kukumbushe ya kwamba hata wewe ulikuwa life member wetu wa chama hii yetu ya kan. Na mimi siku fikiria kanu watakuja tufanye kazi pamoja. Na ninawaomba safadhali na waomba kura yenu tafadhali. Thank you sana. Asante. So for him, he played the game. I have an interest. The interest of my people is this. And so where they're, they are leaning to is to my Kibaki, where their interests are. And so I can't go against the green. I have to join them and work with them and support them and build them and fight for them. And I think it was a very good move and a good strategy, as you say. And therefore, it was now, there was no doubt after Kibaki who the leader of the community was going to be. So it was strategic. 
It is just a few minutes to 7 p.m. Kenyan time on Sunday, the 30th of December 2007. Chief Justice Dr. Evans Gisheru is summoned to conduct a nightfall ritual at State House, Nairobi. Mimi Mwai Kibaki na hapa kwamba nitakuwa mwaminifu kwa Jumhuri ya Kenya na kuitumikia kwa moyo wangu wote. A ceremony with a heavy stench of impropriety. Itailinda na kuitetea katiba ya Kenya. President Mwai Kibaki is being sworn in for a second term after controversially winning the hotly contested 2007 election. I call upon all candidates and Kenyans in general to accept the verdict of the people. It will be the beginning of Kenya's darkest hour, violence. The country is literally burning. Kibaki had been sworn in less than two hours after the declaration shortly after 4 p.m. by the Electoral Commission that he had won a second term. We didn't take long. At Pentagon, I was watching those clips we had fixed up there. The announcement came. Kibaki to announcing the winner is Mike Kibaki. The entire Pentagon house was into, into mourning. They simply broke down. Some of them even collapsed. You know what has happened in the last uh, election? I mean, I remember I had to be involved in first aid on some of them. Because that was the last thing to expect. That was the last thing to expect. Because that election was won by the Orange team. Events of the day and investigations that followed <laughs> revealed that the Electoral Commission conducted a sham election. You, sir, both of you gentlemen, were wise to come to the conclusion to appoint IREC instead of trying to do a recount. That would be impossible. To put it bluntly, nobody will ever be able to say who won or who lost this election. It was simply too bad before any results got to the KICC. Over 1,000 people are killed and over 600,000 others displaced. To prevent the situation falling into a further crisis and after lengthy mediation talks led by former UN boss Kofi Annan, truce is reached and a coalition government is formed. Mwai Kibaki becomes president, Raila Odinga, prime minister, and Uhuru Kenyatta and Musalim Davadi, his two deputies. Uhuru was also appointed minister for trade. They created the position of the prime minister and two deputies. One of the deputies was going to go to ODM, which uh, Raila gave to Musalim Davadi. The other one was a fight, actually, between Matakarua and uh, Uhuru. But Kibaki was clear, Martha was part of PNU, which was Kibaki's party. And the partner who supported PNU was Kanu. And Uhuru was the leader of Kanu. So Kibaki picked uh, Uhuru uh, over Martha Karwa. January 2009. The Deputy Prime Minister is moved to the finance docket. Kenyatta would oversee unprecedented spending on infrastructure. In his budget speech for the physical year ending in June 2011, the finance minister allocated 182 billion shillings, or 18% of the government spending plan for road, railway and energy projects. During his time as the finance minister, you realize he really supported Kibaki uh, in terms of advice, I think he gave good advice because many people say in Kibaki's time there was not this, but they forget the person who held that docket was one Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta. Usijali dini yake, wewe umtakie mwenzako ama, ama. David Murade says being in cabinet during the Grand Coalition government 
prepared him for the future. He was heavily involved in the campaign for the 2010 constitution. But a few months after the promulgation of the new constitution, ICC delivered what appeared to be a hammering blow to Kenyatta's presidential ambition. Mr. Kenyatta, would you kindly stand up and introduce yourself? 15th of December 2010, ICC Chief Prosecutor Louis Moreno Ocampo is reading names of the suspected perpetrators of the murderous post-election violence after the 2007 vote. Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto are on his list of six. Mr. Kenyatta's role was to facilitate the activities of the Mungiki and Mr. Mudaura and Ali's role was to let them to commit the crimes. William Ruto and Henry Kosgi, leaders of the Orange Democratic Party movement, uh, began preparing a criminal plan to attack those identified as supporters of the Party of National Unity, in particular in the area of Rift Valley. But Kenyatta and William Ruto will turn the ICC predicament into a political weapon. <laughs> It is what brought together the Uhuruto Alliance. Now the fact that both of them appeared to be victims of international machinations had the effect of pulling them together. They are both victims of imperialistic uh, uh, under, undertakings. And so they have something in common, they have a common enemy. And instead of diminishing their influence and popularity with the population, it had done the exact opposite. Would you speak a little bit louder, Mr. Ali? Oh yeah, the ICC issue was in their favor, openly in their favor. The Jubilee Coalition's successful branding of Uhuruto's ICC cases as a neo-colonialist Western tool to subdue Africans became as brilliant as it was effective. Uhuru and Ruto used the same misfortune as their claim to credibility, playing the victim card all the way to State House. Then came public adoration. The digital boy slogan attracted many. My name is Anoxicoli, and this is the Kenyan historian.